This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. I just want to say to you, thank you all for getting your essays in. Um, they're looking really good. I'm hoping to get them back, some feedback back to you next week on those. Hopefully Monday, but it could be a few days after that, all right? Um, the other thing I want to make sure that you've done is to listen to the lecture from week five that was an online lecture by Barkey, who talked about plant diseases, okay? So make sure that you also listen to that because that lecture, along with Peter's lectures, will, will govern what you choose to do for your next assignment for the symposium, okay? So I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter K. Fred, who's a vet and a researcher from the Faculty of um, Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences. This is the first of three lectures that Peter will give, and he'll be talking to you about um, animal-derived food contaminants, as, along with a bit of biosecurity at the end. So this will help you very much towards your next assessment task. Um, Peter's lectures are incredibly interesting. Sometimes the slides are a little bit confronting, but they're strangely fascinating. So I hope you enjoy. Thanks, Peter. No worries. Thank you, Andrea. Um, as Andrea said, I'm, I'm a, a, a vet, um, although I'm not in practice anymore. I'm still registered. but. Um, I'll, I'll perhaps give you a bit of a, a perspective of the veterinary side, but even more importantly, um, I'm actually in the Department of Agriculture, and in our department, um, we, we are looking at agricultural-related um, issues. And I think these lectures, are, well, certainly it's my intention to make these lectures based around some of the big issues. And I think there are some really big, important issues when it comes to, to animals. Now, animals um, are either um, providing food via, um, via the process of, of, um, of providing their meat, in the case of, say, uh, beef cattle and um, um, lamb and the like. But also there's animal products as well, like eggs and, and um, milk. And we'll look at some of the issues that are, that are involved there. Today we're going to look at the, the issue of chemical con contamination. There's various ways that animals can be contaminated by chemicals, either intentionally or not intentionally, and we'll take a look at how that can affect our health in regards to those chemicals ending up in the food chain. So um, I guess the major focus of this is, is I'll be looking at what's happening out with agricultural production of animals, but we're really looking at what happens to the consumer, what happens to the consumer with the, the products that they consume and what the risks are and how we can reduce those, those risks. Um, next week we'll be talking about the diseases, uh, so we'll look at how we can get diseases from the animals um, and then the final week we'll focus, as Andrea said, we'll focus more on the biosecurity aspects or whatever, which I think should be interesting comparing that to to plants. In fact, I, I should maybe sort of check what is being said in the uh, in the plant lectures to see how closely that aligns or doesn't align or whatever. But my, my belief is that uh, probably a lot of the things I'll say about animals and animal supply security um, are basically reflected in, in uh, the, the plant material as, as well. Um, yeah, plants are a little bit different, but uh, nevertheless, I think there's a lot of common uh, issues. So, um, as Andrea said, I guess there's quite a number of um, photos, confronting or otherwise. Um, and also, I might put out a fair amount of detail in the lectures, but I think the important thing to, to grasp at is what are the issues behind this? This is really the, the main thrust of the, the lectures rather than a whole lot of material, a uh, whole lot of facts. Uh, but I think facts are important uh, in order to be able to understand various aspects. So anyway, let's, let's go on to this. So um, we consume products. Well, maybe not all of us. I don't know how many people are, are vegans or vegetarians. Uh, but we, when we consume animals or animal products, we might also be taking in various drugs. So what sort of drugs are we actually talking about? 
Well, there's a number of therapeutic drugs uh, that we treat our animals with. Now, as a veterinarian, I guess I'm, I'd be um, horrified to think that we wouldn't be able to use certain treatments for animals. This is going to safeguard their, their health. And so therefore I would argue that there's certainly reasons why, for example, we should be using antibiotics with animals. Now, how we use those antibiotics and when we use those antibiotics and maybe the restrictions on the use of antibiotics, I'll be the first to agree. But as a veterinarian who needs to treat sick animals, um, I think we would be looking at some major issues, including some major animal welfare issues, if we're restricted from using some of these chemicals. So, what I'm saying is not that we shouldn't use these chemicals, but perhaps we need to think about when and how we use these, these chemicals. So this includes antibiotics, which are, are effective against various uh, pathogens, but we've also got antifungals against fungal inf infections, antihelmintics, uh, these are against helmets, which are internal worms. So there's lots of internal uh, parasites that uh, um, animals get, as well as humans. And uh, luckily we have drugs for those. Antiparasitics are against external parasites, lice and, and fleas and, and nits and um, ticks and the like. And finally, we've also got antitoxins, which can be useful drugs to, uh, to fight against various uh, toxins. Uh, that come from, for example, bacteria and the, and the likes. We've also got prophylactic uh, treatments as well. Now these are a little bit more controversial because the idea of this is that we're going to give treatments in order to prevent disease. Now a major theme that I'm going to have in my lectures is surely we should be aiming for prevention rather than treatment. In fact, we can end up treating animals a lot and maybe unnecessarily treat them if we don't focus on prevention. So um, in general, prevention is a great idea, but what about prophylactic use of drugs to prevent disease? This is a little bit more problematic. We commonly do that, uh, for example, against a particular group of diseases called uh, coccidia, and we can try to prevent these. Now these are very common diseases that happen in young um, animals, and it happens uh, particularly in the poultry industry that uh, young birds are very um, prone to these coccidial infections. And so we can help prevent them by putting small doses of chemicals that fight against these, uh, these, bacteria, uh, these um, organisms. And these organisms won't build up into large numbers, so therefore we, we gain some um, advantages over the fact that the animals are exposed to small amounts of the, the infection. Um, they build up an immunity to it, which gives them longer term uh, prevention against them. But the thing is we are dosing um, small doses of these chemicals over quite a long time uh, to the animals. So there's the possibility that this could end up in the food chain and also some other um, complications that I'll talk about later on. Also post-surgery uh, antibiotics. We might be doing various procedures with the an animals. And at a, a stage in the past, this would have been seen as very non-controversial. Surely it's something that we should be doing. So if we're doing some sort of uh, invasive procedure with an animal, surely we should give them antibiotics. Now, do they have an infection at that time? No. So why are we giving the antibiotics? Oh, well, just in case an infection occurs. We've needed to rethink that um, very seriously, and I'll get on to those, the, the issues uh, why, uh, but this is to do with um, antibiotic uh, re resistance. Uh, these sorts of things are still done. We are still using an um, antibiotics, for example, uh, prophylactically. We need to be a little bit more cautious about how we're, we're doing that. Growth promotants um, are chemicals that can promote and increase the rate of growth of animals. Uh, can enhance the uh, development of animals and there's a lot of potential that this could help with agricultural production. However, they're also fairly controversial uh, treatments as well and so there's, uh, there's, there's some growth promotants that are allowed in some countries and some growth promotants that are banned in, in other countries as well. So this is an extra uh, issue that uh, we need to consider. Um, if it's okay to use growth promotants, we need to make sure that we're using them appropriately. Uh, but there's great concern about the use of growth promotants. A lot of people will tell you that, oh, well, if you eat chicken, of course you'll be eating all these growth promotants, all these chemicals, all these hormones. It's full of growth promotants, it's full of hormones. 
Well, here in Australia, I'd contend that that's not actually the case. Um, that we actually don't use uh, a lot of growth promotants and, and hormones in, for example, poultry production. But there is still the possibility that we're using certain chemicals that can end up in the food chain. So I think the issue is, is certainly a, a, an important one, but perhaps we need to be more specific about exactly what it is we're talking about. And certainly there's uh, plenty of people that are, are quick to, to, to claim that uh, there's a lot of use of, of things like growth pr promotants. So perhaps we need to, to, to know just what is happening um, in order to, to be able to, to assess what the, the risks are. And then there's non-intentional -ex exposure. So before all those things that I've mentioned, these are intentionally used. These are things where we say, well, in order to help the health of the animal, we're using these treatments. I guess growth promotants maybe don't quite fit into that. And then we've got non-intentional exposure. And we're now realising that this is actually much greater than we would have uh, thought in, in the past. There's a lot of environmental um, contamination of various chemicals, including antibiotics, and I'll get on to that uh, issue as well. This ends up being a, an important issue, uh, especially in some countries where it, it, uh, it's now found that there's um, um, antibiotics that are not only getting into the food chain, but also into the environment. And this has a, a great effect in, in driving up higher and higher levels of antibiotic resistance. But as well as that, we can end up with chemicals on, in feed and feeding equipment. It could be that uh, it might be quite appropriate to use some, uh, some chemical, some um, um, prophylactic chemical or, or some uh, therapeutic chemical, but um, for particular animals at particular ages at particular stages. But what happens if we end up feeding it to the wrong animals? Maybe animals that are, are close to providing um, food in the, f the food chain, and so therefore we can end up with chemicals in that. And there's also a whole lot of plants. In fact, a lot of those chemicals that I've talked about, if we say, where did they come from? Well, they came out of a research project where people were looking for particular chemicals to do things. And it turns out plants are pretty wonderful at providing us a wide range of chemicals that do all sorts of things. And so a lot of plants provide us with a lot of chemicals that are used by the pharmaceutical companies, for example, to produce so many of the chemicals that uh, we actually, actually use. But what this means is that there's lots of plants out there, and if the animals consume those plants, we need to be cautious about what they're actually consuming and what chemicals are coming uh, into, the, uh, into the animal uh, at, at, uh, along with that, uh, that process as, as well. Okay, so there's lots of chemicals that we might need to be thinking about. There's lots of issues to do with uh, this as, as, as well. So one of the ones that I'm going to be mainly focusing on today is going to be food chain con uh, contamination, residues. So what we'd like to think is that if we eat um, meat products or animal-derived products such as eggs or, or milk, surely now, OK, the vegetarians or the vegans are among you will say, well, I'm not so convinced about this, but surely most of us who say, well, yes, we'd like to eat those products would also claim that these are healthy products for us. If we want to make sure that we're getting lots of calcium, then eating uh, milk products is supposedly a good way of, of sourcing that, getting iron through meat. Uh, those sorts of things. So what we'd like to think is that if we eat uh, things in the food chain that are derived from animals, that this is actually a healthy product. But what happens if it's not such a healthy product? Because as well as consuming all the good nutrients that we're getting, we're also consuming some residues that maybe aren't so healthy for us. So that's the issue that we need to uh, address there. With a number of those chemicals that I've already mentioned, we're also get, getting a rising problem with the fact that they're not working as well. The drugs aren't working as well as they did. And I'll focus in particular on antibiotics. But this also applies to a, a wide range of the other things that I mentioned as well. Antihelmintics as well. We've, we're getting more and more resistance um, for the antiparasitics. We're getting more and more resistance. And this is because we haven't been particularly smart in the way we've been using these drugs. So what I'm saying, I guess, is that these drugs have a purpose. Um, in, in most cases, we might be giving them to the animal for a very specific purpose. But there's complications. 
that um, can arise from giving these, these drugs. And so perhaps we should be even more cautious and careful about how we're doing it. And the reality is we haven't been particularly good at this, and this has led to one of the, the big issues, which has been resistance. Uh, the worms are becoming resistant against, against the treatments that we've used. Uh, the, the bacteria are becoming resistant against the, uh, the, bacteria, uh, the antibiotics that we're, we're using. And unfortunately, sometimes the answer to that might seem to use more of them or use higher doses. This then brings up more issues to do with residues as well. So perhaps we could rethink about how we're, we are using these, these chemicals and what we're doing there. And there's some big complications about this if we get things wrong. And one of the thing, things that we need to consider is the fact that there's lots of countries overseas. Um, I, I don't want to particularly point out that uh, the EU, but the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the EU is particularly concerned about the quality of the products that they import, the animal products that they, they import, and in particular things like residues. And in fact, there's a lot of chemicals that we might quite legitimately, quite legally use in Australia that are not allowed to be used in the EU. So if we're going to um, send things across to the EU, we need to ensure that we don't have contamination or residues of various chemicals in the products that we send over. And if we do, we risk losing those markets. So uh, it's fairly complicated because different countries or different uh, economic blocks might have different rules and regulations about that. Well, just because it's difficult doesn't mean we, we uh, shouldn't take that very seriously. And in fact, we do need to take it very, very seriously because uh, here in Australia, we are very dependent on our um, export markets for a lot of these uh, products. Just one example of where we can get this wrong. Um, how are we going to make sure that we don't allow certain growth promotants to get into the meat that is, ends up being exported to the, uh, the EU? Well, we have systems in place. So, for example, if you're a beef producer and you've got cattle and you want to market your cattle, you want to sell your cattle, and it could be that those cattle end up going to the EU. This could um, enhance the price that you get. OK, the only thing is, if you've used certain um, growth promoters, you won't be able to, they won't be able to enter that market. So how do we know that that's the case? Well, we have a really nice system which says that if I'm the, the, the producer, I'm the farmer, I'm going to, when I sell, sell this group of cattle, I'm going to sign up, sign a sheet that says I haven't used these particular chemicals. And this means that if anyone buys those cattle, uh, they go to slaughter, um, those, that document can, can follow those cattle. And so therefore, if it's end, ending up going to the EU, someone's got a document to say, these cattle have never been uh, given this chemi these chemicals in the past. So that sounds a really good system. Well, it's not just a matter of having the systems, it's also a matter of having compliance with those particular systems. A number of years ago, uh, that compliance was certainly questioned. Um, so it sounds a great system, but um, yeah, if you've got the system, perhaps you've got to just check to make sure that the system's working. Well, the EU um, do send delegations from time to time to Australia to check out how we're doing things. And so we'd like to say that we're doing things really well. So yes, if we're exporting uh, beef to the EU, don't worry about it. We've got this system to make sure that there's no residues in the meat that you're, you're taking to the EU. And we've got all these forms. Anyway, so the EU went for a tour. They went on certain properties and they, you know, they spoke to the farmers and the farmers were saying, oh, no, we don't use those chemicals and, oh, that's great. And then they went to the abattoirs, very happy with all that as well. And then they went to the, the um, uh, sale yards to see how the, the cattle were, were being sold. I'm very impressed with that. And just as they were about to leave, one of them asked, look, can we just see what happens to the, the sheets now? The farmer signs them, doesn't it? Yes, yes. And where do they go after that? Oh, well, they're taken by the stock agents, and then the stock agents send them on. OK, could we just check, you know, can we walk into one of the stock agents and just, you know, see what they're doing with the forms? Yeah, that sounds a great idea. So they walk into a stock agent's, and there's a stock agent sitting at, a, at his desk, working very diligently with a big pile of these these declarations, 
And look, unfortunately, he's saying, look, the farmers find it very hard to fill out these forms. It's very tedious to fill out these forms. So as a service, he's helping out the farmers by filling in these forms and signing them. The EU was not impressed with that. We came very close to losing uh, the market, maybe temporarily or maybe locked in the longer term. We had to do a lot of explaining and we had to also ensure that we have got a system and that is not what uh, is, is, uh, is commonly done. And in fact, um, we had to, to make sure that um, um, the agents weren't filling out forms and those sorts of things and signing on behalf of the farmers. Certainly, um, we might have documents that say our animals are free of these chemicals, but if that's not actually um, done diligently, then what does that really count, count for? Not much at all. So this is, uh, has a, a real threat to, uh, to farmers' uh, uh, um, income, a threat to our prosperity that we can drive from our export markets. And I think even more than that, and this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue, we're having a lost confidence in consumers. Now, there's the, also the issue of people who, pluff, uh, who, who want to uh, push for uh, veganism or vegetarianism. Um, I must admit, I, for a while, I was, uh, I was certainly in that uh, vegetarian camp, uh, and I know the arguments for it, and yeah, there's quite strong arguments for it. But what about the people who do like to eat meat, do like to eat uh, milk products and eggs, but they're a bit concerned about it? Well we are becoming more and more concerned about the quality of the animal-derived products that we consume. There's more and more concern about various aspects of, of that. Uh, I mentioned before that um, in spite of the fact that it may not necessarily be uh, rooted in, in, uh, in much accuracy, a lot of people will tell you that, uh, oh yes, chicken is full, the commercial chicken is full of these, these um, chemicals. Well, there are certain residues and there are certain chemicals that are getting into our food chain. And so we need to know what they are and we need to, to, to know that we've got a system to try to minimise the likelihood of us consuming uh, things that we don't want to consume. So whether this is logical, whether this is actually based on, on hard evidence that says these residues will harm us, I don't think that's really the issue. What we have is a building loss of confidence from consumers. Consumers are becoming more and more concerned that the eggs that they're eating are not necessarily as good as they originally thought. Um, they're questioning whether when they, they eat a, a healthy uh, uh, cheese, is it really as healthy? Now this has led to uh, the, the rise and in interest in buying things that are organic. Now I don't want to get into that whole argument about what's organic and what's not organic, but I think it does reflect very strongly this, this concept that people sit, say, well I'm not too sure whether I, I'm totally convinced that if I eat the general eggs, you know, the, the, the non-organic eggs, that, that you know, it's necessarily as good and, and safe and as healthy as I'd like to think. And so perhaps one of my options is to eat the organic eggs. Okay, so um, I think that's really um, also expressing this loss of confidence. And I think it's not going away, it's increasing. And so if we are to still produce products, animal products for con consumption, I think we've got to really lift the game and make sure that we're doing whatever we can to make sure that the, the, the consumer actually has an increased confidence in what they're consuming. Otherwise, I'm not too sure why we're consuming animal products. A lot of the arguments for, for consuming animal products is that they're supposed to be good for our health. Um, okay, I don't want to uh, in, uh, enter into an argument with the vegans and the vegetarians who say, no, I can get enough protein, no, I can get enough vitamin B12, no, I can get enough iron from my mixed diet. Definitely that's possible, but it's also difficult. I don't know, have we got any vegetarians here who, who worry about how difficult it is to, to really balance it up? I think you should be, because getting enough B12 is, is, is an issue that you've got, to, you've got to work on. You can't just ignore it and say, oh, yes, I eat a, a bit of variety, so therefore I'll get enough B12. Okay, so for the, for the animal consumers among the group, you say, oh, but that's good, because I eat these animal products, and surely this is looking after my health. Well, are we looking after our health or are we actually putting our health at risk because of these, uh, these residues and the like?
Okay, as well as that, there's also uh, an issue that I'll just touch on briefly, but we've also got certain chemicals that are actually produced for animals, for animal use, that are being abused by humans as, as well. Now, this becomes an issue for the health departments in the country. Um, for example, um, ketamine is a commonly used anaesthetic for animals. Apparently, you can go to certain uh, clubs or or the like, and um, if someone's offering you special K, this is not a, a breakfast cereal that they're offering you, it's actually ketamine, which is a, a drug that I really cannot understand why people would want to, to take it um, because of its effects, but regardless, this is being abused. Um, there's various um, anabolics that are used for animals. Now, as a veterinarian, I, I will certainly claim that anabolics have a legitimate um, place in treating animals. If we have animals that are very sick, have been very sick for some time, and we want to help them recover, short-term use of anab anabolics can be very useful under those circumstances. So there is a legitimate use, very limited, but a le legitimate use of anabolics. Unfortunately, anabolics that have been developed for animals end up in gyms being consumed by weight uh, bodybuilders to build up their bodies. Now, you might think that's crazy. You might think, you know, why would someone use chemicals that, that are only registered for animals that have not been tested in humans, although I guess the bodybuilders are testing the chemicals by using them. Um, why would you do that? Well, I guess that's a really good question that I don't have an answer to, but it is happening. And so what this means is that the health department looks at these issues and says, you know what, maybe we need to clamp down on the use of these chemicals. So yes, the veterinarians and, and the like and their farmers are telling us that we want to use these drugs, but the trouble is they're also being used by people under various dodgy circumstances, and this is a concern. So maybe in order to, to safeguard human health, we're going to restrict the use of these chemicals. And already that sort of thing's happening. Already, for example, with um, because of use of, of various chemicals. Uh, these chemicals have been um, used in the human field, maybe quite inappropriately, quite illegally. They then get restricted in their use for animals. Now, I think that's not so good for, for us looking after the welfare of, of the animals, but we have to acknowledge that that's the case. Um, one major theme that we'll, I'll, I'll keep coming back to is that when we go looking at issues of health, I'm going to talk about welfare and health of the animal, but there's something that, that is, is always gazumping that, something that's up and above that, and that's our health. Now, you can call that speciest, you know, our species is looking after ourselves number, as the number one issue, and I guess that's just the reality of it. So even though I might say, well, but what about looking after the animals, uh, that's okay, but the reality is our society says our health is, is number one. So therefore, we've got to make sure that we, if we are using drugs with animals, we are doing it effectively and carefully. Okay, so yeah, there's a whole lot of anabolics and things. People even self-medicate with animal uh, products. I, that I find really, really strange. Um, there's a whole lot of uh, prohibited uh, use of, uh, for you know, race horses and the like, which I won't go on to it. And the health authorities have big powers to, to prevent that. Uh, more and more drugs are only available via vet veterinarians. Um, this is what's meant by prescription. Vets don't necessarily write out prescriptions, but more and more the health authorities are saying we want more and more control over the chemicals that are being used with animals. Um, and we've got to make sure that we, uh, we ensure that we've got s secure storage of these animal products aren't being used by, uh, by humans. And if we can't do that, then that's simple for the health authorities withdraw their, their use from animals. Okay, so what sort of drug residues do we end up with our, within our animals? Well, a number. Anti antibiotics, which I'm going to talk about. So we treat animals with antibiotics. The animal's got some sort of illness, um, some sort of bacterial illness. As a veterinarian, I'm going to say, well, isn't it wonderful that we've got antibiotics to fight that infection? And yes, we can do that. We can give them antibiotics. But what happens if those antibiotics are still in the system when the animal goes to slaughter? Or well, what happens if those antibiotics end up being in the milk that ends up in the, in the food chain or the eggs? And so therefore, we've got to be concerned about, about that one for a number of reasons which we'll get to. Um, Antelmintics can end up in the, uh, in the 
uh, the food chain as well. Pesticides, external parasite products. So basically all those things that I was mentioning before, these can be issues with uh, drug uh, res residues. Hormonal growth promotants, we're getting more and more concerned about that. There's certainly some people who will argue, look, the scientific literature says certain growth promotants don't appear to be a risk to humans. And, okay, in some cases that certainly can be the case, but that's not the end of the issue. And remember this issue about uh, dropping confidence of the consumers. So even if the scientific evidence says that um, small residues of these um, uh, growth promotants aren't an issue for health, the consumer can still be very concerned about that. Okay, there's also heavy metals uh, such as lead and cadmium that can end up in the food chain as well. And these are uh, not healthy things to be consuming in large, uh, large amounts. Often this is, this is not, well, this is generally not because of, of um, therapeutic use, but this is where we have um, environmental contamination getting into, into, the, uh, in, into the cycle. Arsenic can be an environmental um, contaminant but it can also be a therapeutic contaminant as well. Now you might say, well arsenic, isn't that a poison? Well, in large doses it is. In small doses it actually has a, a stimulant, uh, a growth stimulant effect. It increases appetite, for example. And still it's used occasionally for that, uh, that reason. In the past it used to be used uh, for um, um, treating animals for certain parasites as, as, as well. Unfortunately, arsenic hangs around the environment for a long time. So, for example, in sheep um, dips that have been, haven't been used maybe for a few decades, there still can be quite high levels of arsenic um, that end up in the grass growing around that, that area. So even though that, that particular sheep dip hasn't been used for some time, we can still have animals picking up higher levels of, of arsenic uh, because of that and getting into the food chain. Organochlorines are an interesting group because they've been banned for a number of decades, but we still have residues of those coming around. Now, part of the problem with the organochlorines is that, that they have a very long uh, life cycle, a very long um, expanse of time that they're actually uh, in the environment. So that can be in the environment for a long, long time, in fact, uh, you know, even though it's been a number of decades, we're still getting organic chlorides um, persisting in the soil. And what we need to do is make sure that if, if um, organic chlorides that have been used as treatments in the past um, are in the soil, we need to work out where those areas are, fence them off, maybe not have animals continually grazing in those areas. And then when the land is sold, we need to make sure that people realise, no, this is an area where um, we've got um, organic chlor chlorines um, still contaminating the ground. Then we've got environmental um, contaminants, um, including uh, uh, cadmium and lead, as I've mentioned ag again. But there's also natural con uh, contaminants, such as mycotoxins. Um, now, for example, um, we can have mycotoxins in peanuts. Now, peanuts is a, a common um, source of food um, components in, in diets for animals. And so we can be feeding um, animals uh, peanuts, and there can be small or not so small um, parts of, of, um, of or components of, of, of mycotoxins that end up in the food chain. And these can end up in the animals, and they can end up um, in, the, in the food chain as well. Now, mycotoxins, um, even in very, very small um, doses, can potentially, over time, um, increase your risk of certain cancers. And so I think we do need to be concerned about uh, these things. So even though we might be talking about very small amounts, if we're consuming even very small amounts over a long time, that could potentially build up to being, being a risk, especially with things like, as I said, uh, risks of certain, uh, certain cancers. We do need to be concerned about those things as well. Okay, so let's take a look at what happens with um, chemical residues. Well, the thing with a chemical, if we consume a chemical or an animal consumes a chemical or is given a chemical, typically what we have is a situation where the, uh, the, the chemical might be actually ingested or it might be injected. And typically if we look at the level of that chemical in the, the body of the animal or of, of us, we get a graph similar to the one up the top there. So we have a, a rapidly rising um, phase so very quickly rising up. Now if we inject it, it's a very rapid in 
uh, rise. Uh, if it's ingested, it's still going to be a fairly rapid rise, but maybe not as much. It gets to a peak, and then it declines. Now, the, the, the issue about the decline is if we take a look at that shape of that particular graph, it's an inverse um, um, exponential um, curve, what we see is that it seems to decline rapidly early on, but as we go, the rate of decline decreases. So it's a decreasing rate of decline. And what that means is it gets lower and lower and lower, but does it actually get to zero? Well, you can see that we've got part of the graph there, but the graph's going to continue on if we uh, keep measuring for longer and longer. And quite often we can have chemicals that are there for a long, long time. Now it depends on a number of factors, including which chemical that we're talking about, how long that tail is. But this is very characteristic of any chemical that we put into the body of the animal, or in our body as well, that it may be there at dec decreasingly small amounts, but it could be there for a long, long time. Now, at these levels, these levels might be not very effective for whatever it is that we were treating. Uh, if we're using an antibiotic, it's probably not going to be effective at killing any bacteria. Uh, if we're talking about a, a, some sort of um, therapeutic uh, agent, it's probably not very effective, but it's still there in the body, and it will take a long time to be completely removed or completely broken down by the, the, the body. So therefore, we need to be concerned about uh, when and when the, um, the body is, is going to be eliminating whatever it is that... Uh, uh, we're, we're concerned about, and just what levels we've got to. In fact, maybe we get to a certain level where that level is so low that we're not going to be concerned, or maybe we're going to be always concerned. So what we, uh, what we can do is to do some testing on the shape of this graph, look at uh, uh, animals being dosed with certain chemicals, and take a look at what happens to the levels in the body, and we can try and work out what levels we might be okay with or not okay with. And one of the things we can test for is to work out uh, where it drops so that we get to the point where there's no observable adverse effect limit. So this is the dose that we could measure that says, look, at that point, the evidence is it appears to have no adverse effect on the animal, or no effect at all on the animal. Okay, so that sounds pretty good. Now, no effect means even in trace, elements, uh, trace amounts, it's not going to increase the risk of cancer or whatever. Now, this might still be a very, very low level, but it's the level that the scientific study that we've done of this chemical indicates that at that level or below, it's safe. Now, the only thing is, more research might indicate that that level that we thought was safe is not as safe as we thought, and we might need to drop the, the, the Noel uh, level a little bit lower, and maybe a little bit lower as more and more research is done. So th what this means is that we, we are requiring more and more research of these chemicals, and we need to be on the, um, the, gut, uh, on the look, outlook and very cautious about what we're, we're expecting to be safe levels of that particular uh, chemical. Now, that's OK, but how much risk are we actually at? Well, that really depends a little bit on how much we're exposed. So we might have a level in an animal, and you might say, well, I'm a vegetarian, so I'm never going to eat that animal, so therefore <laughs> it doesn't matter what level you want to talk about, it's not going to affect me. Or you might say, well, OK, this is a level in beef, I hardly ever eat beef, only once a year do I eat beef. And so therefore, I'm not much at much risk. Or you might say, oh, I love steaks, and you know, five days a week I eat a big steak. Oh, OK, well, if we've got a certain level of the chemical, your exposure is going to be greater. So we can work out the margin of exposure by dividing the Noel by the total dietary exposure. OK, so that means we might end up with a certain level in our body. And from that, we could say, well, what about the average meat consumer? Um, what's an acceptable daily intake? And typically what we do is we look at the Noel, divide it by 100 uh, to be safe, and we say, OK, that might be the acceptable daily intake. Now, the trouble with the acceptable daily intake, it's sort of assuming that we're sort of fairly normal. Um, and, uh, you, know, how, you know, how many of us eat, eat um, say, a, who, who eats steak maybe once a week? Who, who eats steak... Well, it's not much point. You, you, 
Um, let, let's, let's broaden it a little bit. Who, who eats uh, meat? Um, chicken, beef, uh, pork? Uh, once a week? Once a day? Three times a day? <laughs> Four times a day? Okay, now you're laughing, but there are actually some people, and I've, I've met them, um, some I'd even say have been friends of mine, who have strange diets and they eat enormous amounts of meat and, to be quite honest, not much else. And you go, surely that's not good. Well, yes, I'd, agree, I'd have to agree that that's the case. But there are people who consume, because of taste, because of their, their, um, their, their diets, um, good or bad, they may consume far more than we might think is logical, far more than we think is usual. And so we've also got to take that into consideration that there's some people out there that do get a fix on a particular uh, thing. For example, we, they might be fixed on one particular type of meat or whatever, and they, they get obsessed about that and they eat enormous amounts of that meat over over a long time. So therefore their, their daily intake may not be necessarily as, uh, as predictable as uh, the average of us. And then we can then look back at the animal and try and calculate what the maximum residue level is. And we can say, well, at that level, we're, that should be safe with the animal, or that above that level is going to be um, not so safe. So again, we can calculate that from the, uh, the parameters that we've got, got at, at present, and then we can get the maximum permissible concentration of the product that we're, we've got. Now, okay, that's fine, but let's go back to the graph there. Now, what, we, what I said is the level that's in the animal really depends on where in the time scale we're sitting. So what happens if we've we're collecting milk from a cow and we've got the situation where there's high levels in the cow and we collect milk then. Well, there's going to be a lot of um, the, the residue then. But here, okay, if we collect the milk then, there's going to be far less. So w what this means is that it's also time dependent depending on when the, the dose of the, the chemical has u been used. Therefore, we use what's potentially a risky measure because there's a whole lot of things that could come to, to, um, to confuse this, uh, the, this, the, the um, effectiveness of this issue, but we, we use what's called a withholding period. And it turns, turns out that one of the major ways we try to prevent um, the ingestion of, of high levels of, or even slightly, high, slightly risky levels of uh, chemical residues is by this concept of the withholding period. So what that says, We've treated the dairy cow with a treatment, and for this particular treatment, going through all this means that we can say, well, five days afterwards, it should be okay to collect and consume the milk. Before then, the levels are probably going to be higher. We shouldn't be using the milk. Okay, so the withholding period is, is designed to safeguard us. But there's a whole lot of complications. What happens if we use more doses of the, uh, the treatment? Maybe the treatment's prolonged for longer. Uh, what happens if the animal's metabolism is, is not so good, especially if we're talking about unhealthy animals? There's a whole lot of things that can mean these withholding periods are not necessarily quite as accurate as we'd like them to be. But nevertheless, the withholding periods are one of our, our most valuable tools in trying to prevent um, residues. But there's one thing that's even more effective than withholding periods, and that's just not using the chemicals at all. And so more and more, we need to divide things up and say, these are chemicals that, that we think are very valuable for, um, drugs or, or, or treatments for the animals, therapeutic agents for the animals, and we're going to continue to use those. We need to be very concerned about withholding periods, very concerned about residues. And there's other things where we go, well, it might be nice to use them. They might be um, promoting the growth of the animal, but maybe we just don't use them. And if we don't use them, then we don't have to worry about a withholding period. There's no, um, no reason to worry about the withholding period. Um, so for things like um, uh, growth promotants in the EU, they've considered that. They believe that the way forward for them is to say, we won't worry about what level uh, is okay or not okay as far as residues goes. We'll just make sure our consumers don't have 
of that in the, in, in the meet. Okay, so how is all this done? This is all done with uh, uh, registration. So the, we've got an organisation here in Australia called the AB, uh, APVMA. Um, it's been a bit controversial because of a move that uh, moved it from um, Canberra to a certain um, electorate. Um, but this is the, uh, uh, this is the organisation that uh, controls what's okay to be used on animals but also on plants as well. So that might get mentioned if it hasn't been mentioned already in the, in the plant section um, as the governing body that says these are chemicals that can be used and also it gives us the data on this. So before registration you have to do all that research in order to be able to work that out. So what this means is that we are in a situation where I think we're fairly well safeguarded because there's extensive toxicological testing that has to be done before registration of products and not only that, once they're registered there's a requirement that continued testing is done and if things change, someone does some research and says well look even at these levels there's dangers further testing needs to be done. So we do have a, a system that I think is, is pretty, pretty secure in, uh, in doing that testing to give us the advice as to what is okay and at what levels and what withholding periods if we are going to use them. As well as that, in Australia I think we have a good system of monitoring and trace back. So what this means is if we do testing and we find that there's a residue in an animal, we have a, a way of tracing it back to the individual farmer um, or farm and working out what's going on and I think that's, uh, uh, that's pretty imp important uh, to be able to do that. In the case of cattle for example, every single cow in Australia is identified when they're born. So the farmer actually has a tag, uh, there's, a, there's a numbered tag for every calf that's born and that number follows that calf through its life and it may go from one farm to another farm, it will maybe go to um, sale yards, may go to an abattoir and all along the way that number follows it. And so this means that if somewhere down the track we find that there's a problem with the, the meat from this, uh, this animal, we can trace that back through its life history uh, and hopefully back to the source of where the, the issue came from. I think this is good because it also means that you know farmers who might think, oh well, who cares if, if I use this? Um, no one's going to, to, to know it, or know about it. Well, there is the chance that we could, they they could be testing for trace levels of certain things. They go, this is higher than what it should be, and we could trace uh, trace that, uh, that that back. There's also monitoring across the system to check that uh, things are being done, and very importantly. Getting back to that point that I men mentioned before about um, declarations and the like, we have a good system of documentation and identification of animals to, to be able to ensure that we should have um, animal products that are uh, very low risk of having um, chemical residues of concern. However, all these systems are only as good as the uh, as the uh, as, as the, the compliance that people involved in the system um, give to the system. And so I think from time to time we have to sort of check to make sure that people are actually taking this very seriously. And for the reasons that I mentioned before, including this issue of declining, um, uh, um, declining confidence of the, uh, the consumer, I think this is really vital that we do take this very, very seriously from time to time you might hear farmers going, oh, all this carry on, all this paperwork, surely it's not necessary. Well, I think it's very, very necessary. Okay, so why do we end up with residues if we've got this great system? Well, some people may not be compliant. So some people may not observe the withholding periods. Um, one really interesting thing is that uh, with, with um, residues of antibiotics in milk, this has been an issue for quite a while, and so you know it's not a nice idea that we're eating, milk, we're drinking milk or, or milk products that have residues of antibiotics. And so for a long time, it was sort of being um, impressed upon the, the dairy farmers that it's very important to make sure that you're having withholding periods and the like. And they were sort of saying, oh yes, yes, we're doing the right thing, we're doing the right thing, but maybe some of them weren't quite so compliant. Now, a number of years ago, they brought in a very simple uh, little technique that actually, I think, had quite a remarkable effect. Very simple technique. And one of the ways that you uh, treat the, the cows with antibiotics, 
And in fact, one of the main reasons you want to treat these cows with antibiotics is they get infections of the memory gland. This is called mastitis. And so to treat the mastitis, you inject a cream that contains the antibiotics into the, the memory gland. So it's antibiotics, concentrated antibiotics in the memory gland. Surely you don't put that into the milk that's going into the vat to be collected by the truck. Well, you'd hope not. But was that happening? Well, maybe it was happening. So what they did is a very simple thing. They just put a bright blue dye into the treatment. You could not get the treatment for antibiotics, for, for intramammary treatment, unless it had the dye in it, this bright blue dye. And so that meant when the farmer injected the, the, uh, uh, the antibiotic, it had a bright blue dye. Now, the dye has no effect on the animal, but what it does mean is for a couple of days after, the milk is blue. Now, it probably means that if you're a dodgy farmer, and hopefully we don't have too many dodgy farmers, but if you're a dodgy farmer and you're collecting the milk and it's looking a bit blue, surely you're not going to think that's a good idea to put that into the vat and, and give a blue tinge to the milk. Um, as, uh, milk who, who drinks milk? Who would like to drink um, blue milk? You, you go to the fridge and, oh, there's nice blue milk. Oh, that's interesting. I'll see what that's like. Um, there is Blue Heaven um, um, milkshakes and things like that which are blue, but you know, I think we know that it's supposed to be blue. But the concept that we would eat, or drink blue tinged milk is pretty, um, pretty abhorrent to, to most of us, I think. And so what this meant is I think compliance increased. Now, did it or didn't? Didn't it? Well, that's often hard to really judge. But one very interesting thing that happened shortly after this particular event is that. Uh, there was a survey done of GPs, GPs around the suburbs. And there was something really interesting that happened just a few months after this, and the GPs couldn't work out why. But what they noticed is that there's all these kids with non-specific allergies, and they noticed about a 20% decline in these non-specific allergies. These kids weren't getting those allergies quite so often. And, and the GPs were at a loss to explain what was going on. The only thing that was linked to that appeared to be this change in the administration of the, uh, the antibiotics in the, in the intramammary treatments. And so I think, you know, look, it's circumstantial evidence. It wasn't necessarily proven to be a direct link, but I think that was pretty good circumstantial evidence that says that by increasing compliance by a simple thing of putting the, the dye in the, in the treatment, we actually had a health benefit for those kids. I think. This, to, to my mind, this is just one little example of how this is really important that even if we might think that small residues aren't going to hurt anyone, maybe we, we can't underestimate the importance of making sure that we uh, uh, observe withholding periods and the like. Overdosing. Unfortunately, I don't know whether this is an Australian thing or an Australian farmer thing or whatever, but lots of people think, oh, look, if you give this dose to the animal and it, and it, it works, it seems to go really well, surely it's much better if you give twice as much. And four times as much, it'd be even better, wouldn't it? Well, that, drugs don't necessarily work that way, and overdosing is certainly a way that we could uh, mean that we end up with a higher level in the animal. And so therefore, if we go back to our graph, we could end up even at the so-called withholding period with a, a higher level than we would have expected. And so therefore, overdosing is certainly putting the whole system at, at risk. Inappropriate application. Okay, so us vets are expensive, so people tell us. And so some farmers might say, well, I've got some leftover treatment on, I don't know, we've got another sick cow, maybe I'll just try this treatment, see what happens. Well, that's inappropriate application, and that might also lead to, to problems. Use of unregistered compounds. There's been a major push uh, by the authorities to, to try and get rid of unregistered compounds, but there's still unregistered compounds that people use. It's, oh, this seems to work really well. Well, the only trouble is, what's the evidence about residues? What, what do we know about that? Well, if they haven't been registered, they prob there probably hasn't been uh, research done on residues and their effects. And so, therefore, we're putting things at risk. Uh, believe it or not, there's also prohibited substances that might end up in the, uh, in the food chain as, as, as well. Um, so this is illegal, and these are prohibited substances that are illegal to be consumed. Um, but also, inadequate documentation is a major thing. So, OK, it might be OK to have a certain residue for certain situations, uh, but we need to have the documentation to say when we 
do require uh, low or no um, residue, that that's actually the case. And as I mentioned before, uh, we can have breakdowns in the problem with, for example, contamination of feed or feed equipment. Quite often we get that. Um, next week we'll see with um, um, various diseases, bacterial diseases. Um, these can spread to the animals and, and, and onwards uh, through contaminated feeds and feed, uh, feed equipments. Okay, so I mentioned about resistance and I'll continue on about this and, and uh, have a, a bit more of a rave um, coming up about resistance. But as I said, antibiotics. This is a big issue and I'll explain why I think it's, it's a huge issue and of great concern. But we've also got major concerns about the fact that the antelmintics aren't working as well. Antiparasitics aren't working as well. So there's a, certainly a pattern here and, and the ex explanation for the pattern is we haven't been particularly strategic in the use of the chemicals that we've been using, the drugs and the, the therapeutic agents that we've been using. And so therefore, what this leads to is de decreased effectiveness on the target species. Whatever it is that we're trying to treat, it's not working as well because they're becoming resistant to the, uh, to, to the treatment. And what happens if that resistance transfers to human pathogens? Now, it can be that we can have pathogens, and we'll talk about this next week, pathogens that are in the animal that can then move to the human species. So we can have pathogens that, that are quite happy to jump from animals to humans. These are called zoonoses. And so this way we could be treating animals and we can get resistant um, bacteria that could then end up as human pathogenic bacteria. Um, so we can do that, but also potentially we can pass the resistance on to uh, specific human pathogens as, as well. Um, and we can also have foodborne exposure of human pathogens. So what happens if we consume uh, levels of the drug that are pretty low? Well, the argument could be that at those levels, that's not going to be harmful for us. But is that really the case? What happens if we're talking about very low levels of things like an antibiotics or antelmintics or various other things, and they're exposing our pathogens to very low levels? Now, if you want to select resistant organisms, the best way to do that is to expose them to very low levels of antibiotics or, or antelmintics or whatever it is that you want to, to increase the, the resistance to. I don't, I'm not too sure why you want, want to do this. But the way to most effectively select the ones that are resistant and, and get rid of the ones that aren't so resistant is by exposing them to low levels. So low levels of things, uh, of the drugs, is actually the main driver of resistance. And so therefore residues in the food products could certainly be a major contributor to the build-up of resistance in our human pathogens. A little bit more about that coming up and also um, next week. Um, and what this can mean is that there's more and more concern about uh, the use of these chemicals in animals because potentially this could lead to issues for human health and we can end up with uh, a greater problem. Let's have a bit of a break and uh, we'll come back in, say, five minutes and I'll move on to the what I'm going to call the big issue now, which is antibiotic resistance. Expecting such hot weather in the middle of April. <laughs> 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 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, what I'd like to start off with is a little story. And so, just to let you in, into the flow of the story, it'll take me a little while. But in this story, it starts out really bad. So, I don't know, we could do all, I could try and sort of make it a bit more dramatic and get you to do the woo noises and whatever, but we won't do that. Um, so, it starts out really bad. And then there's a beautiful um, uh, um, improvement on things. Everything's fantastic and, and rosy, and everything turns out fantastic. And then a little bit later on, things start looking gloomy again. So, okay, let's take a look at this story. And this is the story of antibiotics. Okay, so let's go back 100 years ago. So I'm, I'm not that old, but imagine I'm talking to a group of students like yourself 100 years ago. I could stand out the front and I could say, most of you are going to die, and I know why you're going to die. You're going to die of infectious diseases. Bacteria are going to kill you. Most of you are going to die of bacterial infection. That was the major cause of d death in people 100 years ago. For some of you, you might be just you know, going about your daily work, you get a cut, you get an infection in the cut, you end up with septicemia and you die. I'm sorry, that's what's going to happen to you. you know, this is 100 years ago. Maybe I wouldn't be telling people that 100 years ago. They'd say, of course we know that. It's really scary. Okay, so that's the scary bit. How long has that been going on for? Millennia and millennia. Basically, our species have had, had, had to cope with the fact that most people died of infectious diseases for most of our existence. And then, round about 60 or 70 years ago, and starting in the 1940s, there were some very smart scientists that made some amazing discoveries. And these guys were looking and found particular special chemicals. And these chemicals they called initially the, the, um, the magic bullets. Now, what, what, what do we mean by magic bullets? They were looking for chemicals that kill bacteria. Well, we've known how to kill bacteria for many, many years. Um, if you get um, bleach, so we get some bleach, and I've got bacteria, I pour the bacteria in the bleach, kills all the bacteria. It's easy to kill bacteria. Ah, but wait a minute. I want to kill the bacteria inside our body. So how do I do that? What I'm not going to do is inject the bleach into my body. N n who agrees? Not a great idea? Okay. So what we need is a, is a magic bullet. Now this magic bullet, initially it was a, a, a conceptual idea that there was this chemical that would actually be a selective poison. It would poison the bacteria, but not us. And so therefore, a lot of the things that will kill bacteria are not going to fit that category because they also need to be non-toxic to us. And so it took a while for people to start to, to, to look for and find these chemicals. But starting in the 1940s, they started to find these chemicals and they named them antibiotics. And all of a sudden, things for our species took a, a turn for the better, enormously uh, for the better. Okay, so starting with sulfonamides, we can see penicillin pretty early on. Um, was, was discovered in the 1940s. So in the 1940s, started to be developed. And then, boom, from the 1940s and the 50s, you can see lots and lots of different antibiotics were discovered. And so if we continue on into the 1970s, by the time we get to the 1970s, we get an enormous array of different sorts of antibiotics that can be used to fight infections that we have in our bodies. And so if we go back to the 1970s. Now, the 1970s, I guess anyone old enough to, to, to be around in the 1970s? Some of us are. Um, but in the 1970s, bad, bad decade for, for fashion, but a great decade for a number of things. And one of the things that was great about the 1970s is that at this stage, in the 1970s, there were a range of antibiotics that were available to fight basically any infection that people had. So if we go back to the 1920s, Infectious diseases, bacterial infectious diseases, really bad, killed most, most people. And then we get to the 1970s, no one gets killed by infectious disease because we've got antibiotics. So we don't even need to think about bacterial infections. People were seriously talking about um, the, the medical training of, of doctors and saying, maybe we don't need to do so much on infectious diseases. 
we'll just drop all that stuff about bacterial infections because it's pretty easy now. You just give the people antibiotics. It's, why do we need to study so much about uh, infectious diseases? So in the 1970s, it sounded really rosy. And in fact, if you looked at this, more and more antibiotics being discovered. So surely, as we go further on and further on, we're going to get more and more and more and more antibiotics being discovered. Up until then, it was a matter of looking for look, various chemicals. And people were, were looking for chemicals that worked as these magic bullets. So they looked at various fungi producing chemicals and they looked at plants producing chemicals and some of them were you know going into the into the amazon looking for various plants that they found that they they could actually kill bacteria and were quite safe for people and so all these antibiotics were discovered relatively quickly and relatively easily until about the 1970s and then things sort of turned bad at the 1970s now even at the 1970s it was known that things weren't quite so rosy in the 1970s, we can see the, uh, the green dots indicate when the, the chemical, the, the antibiotic was discovered. And then we've got the, uh, the purple arrow. And the purple arrow shows how long we've used those chemicals until we started to see resistance to those chemicals. So even back in the 1970s, people were starting to go, you know what, we did develop a whole lot of antibiotics, but some of these aren't working as, the, as they used to. Oh, but that's okay because we've got so many of them. Doesn't matter. So those ones have stopped working. Doesn't matter because we've got so many others to choose from. Well, unfortunately, as time went on, that situation changed very much for the worse. So getting into the 1980s, we get, start to get to the point where two things are happening. Not so many antibiotics being discovered, and as well as that, more and more of the antibiotics that we've already got are becoming not so useful. We're starting to get the situation where we've got that bacteria that are resistant to all the main antibiotics and eventually to all antibiotics. So by the 1990s we started to have people dying of infectious diseases. These are people that got an, a bacteria that was resistant to all known antibiotics and they were in hospital and they died. And for 30 or 40 years, that was just not thought possible. How could anyone die in a hospital of an infectious disease? We've got these antibiotics. Well, unfortunately, starting in the, uh, the 1990s, people were dying. If we go from the 200s, um, the, 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 the noughties, then more and more people in more and more hospitals are dying of these multi-resistant organisms. Now into our decade, we're starting to see this is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. I don't know about every day, but regularly we are getting people dying in hospitals of infections that they've got that antibiotics do not work. So where are we heading? Well, according to the World Health Authority, they're predicting that by the year 2050, how far away is the year 2050? Who reckons they're going to be still around in the year 2050? I know no one knows, but let's, well, surely we're all going to expect to be there. Well, the scary thing is that it is expected that we are returning to the future, or is that, no, going back to the past. We are going to be in the situation we were back, where we were back in the 1920s, and more, the, the most common reason that people will die will be because of infectious diseases. So... That's not too far away, and that's pretty scary because 2050. So we really only had about 100 years where we were protected against these infectious diseases by these, these antibiotics. So that's a dreadful story. It started out as a good story and then turned out to be a really dreadful story because for millennia, millennia, we had bacteria killing people, killing people, main cause of, of death. And then for 100 years, oh, it looked really great, fantastic. Our, the quality of our lives improved so dramatically, and then we seem to be returning to a, 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 an era where most of us are going to die of infectious diseases. I think that's a dreadful tragedy if that's where we're heading. And unfortunately, that seems to be where we're, we're heading. So what they predict in the year two, um, 2050, um, some people say that's not, not going to be the point. It's probably going to be much earlier, 2040, 2030 even, some people are saying. 
um, that will hit that, uh, that, that bit where, where it'll be antimicrobial resistant infections are going to be the main cause of death of people. More than cancer, more, more than diabetes and road traffic accidents and the, and the rest of them. Okay, so we have a problem. And this problem is that the antibiotics, these, these uh, silver bullets that we had, or the, or the magic bullets that we had, don't seem to be working as well. So let's have a look at what the issue is. Well, basically what happens is we use these chemicals, and these chemicals are selective poisons. Now, if we, some of you, who's done some uh, microbiology and looked at um, bacteria? You know a little bit about bacteria or whatever? Okay. So with bacteria, um, they're cells, but they're quite different cells to our cells. And those differences mean that we can selectively interfere with those processes that they have that our cells don't have. For example, you might know that, uh, um, that bacteria have a cell wall. Now, our cells don't have a cell wall, this firm, hard cell wall. Um, and so what actually happens is they build this cell wall. Now, this is vital for their protection. Bacteria do not last very long without that cell wall. So if we can stop them getting that cell wall, they're stuffed. But we don't have a cell wall, so if we have a poison that stops them producing a cell wall, maybe it's not going to poison us. And that's exactly what penicillin does. So penicillin stops the bacteria from producing a cell wall, and they just um, expand and explode. But you can actually see this under the microscope. It's quite dramatic. Uh, it really kills these bacteria when, uh, when it's effective. But it turns out penicillin is, is pretty, pretty harmless to, to people, even in pretty high, high doses. But there's other different chemicals that are working in different ways. For example, polymyxin B works on the cell membrane, different membrane to, the, to our um, animal um, cell membrane. Um, tetracyclines work on the protein synthesis, and the protein synthesis is pretty similar in bacteria, but a little bit different. They're, um, um, their protein uh, synthesis, their ribosomes are similar but different. And so these chemicals are different enough so that they, or, or they're specific enough so that they interfere with the protein synthesis of the bacteria without interfering with our protein synthesis. Depends a little bit on the dose. So if we use high doses of these antibiotics, we could hit, hit problems. But uh, you can imagine if the bacteria can't produce proteins, it's not going to do much. Um, also, their nucleic acids, similar to our nucleic acids, but there's a few differences, and certain ch chemicals <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, will target that. Our, sul our sulfidimidine works on various growth factors. So these growth factors are important for the growth of certain bacteria. No effect on us. So therefore, we've got different modes of, of activity. And you might think, oh, well, there's so many different ways that these can work. Surely this is going to protect us. Well, unfortunately, bacteria have been developing over the decades abilities to resist all these different ways of working. So initially they worked amazingly effectively, now they're not working out quite so well. Well, we can actually test to find out how that's, that's doing. Uh, and what we can do is we can look for a particular bacteria. So for those that have done uh, microbiology, you're going to say, oh, this is pretty basic stuff, and it is. Um, we can get a swab, and we can smear that over a, pl a, a plate of agar with um, red blood cells, so we, f we can feed the, uh, the, the bacteria. And we can get that to grow over the plate. But all we can, as well as that, we can put little disks of paper on there, little spots of, of, um, of paper there. Now that paper contains concentrations of different antibiotics and what you can see is that here we've got the growth of the bacteria and that's basically the yellow sort of thing and where it hasn't grown is the red, red bits. And what you can see is that there's certain areas of, of uh, the paper surrounded by a red zone. And that means a no-go for the bacteria. The bacteria were not able to survive in that area. And so that tells us that in this particular case, and this is looking pretty good, that there's a couple of antibiotics that are really no good. They're not going to, to, to um, kill the bacteria. So there's no point in using those antibiotics in, in, uh, in the animal or the person because the, the bacteria are growing pretty well right up to the disc. While there's a few others where there's a good, um, a good range of, or, or, or good zone around there where there's no bacterial in, um, um, growth. And so that's a good play. Unfortunately, we don't see those plates quite so often now because that's indicating a number of antibiotics will work. 
what we're seeing is plates with more of the yellow um, zones and fewer and fewer of the red zones. Okay, but this is actually a useful test that we can actually use to, to actually work out which antibiotics to use and which, which uh, we, 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 we shouldn't. Now, antibiotic tests sensitivity testing has been around for quite a number of decades and I'd like to think that we've been using that diligently for a long, long time. The reality is it hasn't been used as, as much as it should have. And part of the problem is that we need to grow the bacteria and then we need to grow the bacteria on the plate with the discs and that takes about a week. So you, before you get a result, it's about a week later. Now, if you've got a bacterial infection and you're going to wait for a week to know which antibiotic to use in order to work out what you're going to treat it with, the person or the animal might be dead within the week. So, unfortunately, this has meant that we haven't done as many um, antibiotic sensitivity testing as perhaps we should have. Okay. We can also determine just what concentrations we can by another technique called uh, minimum inhibitory concentration determination where we, we have the antibiotic at lower and lower doses to see when is it that uh, it uh, kills the bacteria and, and doesn't. Now, again, this is a, a, a quite involved uh, laboratory technique and it takes a while to do that. Um, so what we really need is a much quicker way of determining if we've got an infection, take a swab and tell us as soon as we can whether these, these, these antibiotics are going to work or not. And luckily, this is basically here. Not quite here, but just about here. And this is PCR technology. Who's heard of PCR technology, I presume? A whole lot of people are probably... Who's doing a research project involving PCR? Yeah, OK. So um, PCR... Um, PCR technology is being used in all sorts of things and one of the really, I think, really exciting uses of PCR is we can look at the, the genome of the bacteria and we can look to see which ones are susceptible to which antibiotics. Now this means if we do real-time PCR, I think we're not that far away, I don't know whether Andrea agrees, but it was probably, you know, we could, I can imagine a little boxy thing like this and I get the swab and I put the swab in and I wait for a few minutes and it's going to tell me the answer almost straight away which antibiotic I can use and which one I can't use. Uh, PCR um, te technology has sort of gone from a huge lab um, space to, you know, tiny, much, much smaller machines and I'm sure it'll get smaller and quicker and all that sort of thing. Um, but also there's been a lot of research that's still continuing, in, including in our, our faculty, looking at uh, bacteria and working out which ones have the resistant genes, which ones don't have the resistant genes, which ones will be susceptible to which antibiotics. And this is going to be a useful tool in the future, as long as we use that tool to then make better selections of which antibiotics we actually use. So how do the, anti the bacteria actually get um, resistant to it? Now, a lot of people wrongly think it's all to do with mutations. All of a sudden, they've got a mutation and they're no longer res uh, susceptible to the bacteria. That actually happens fairly infrequently. That doesn't happen very often at all. The main way that they uh, actually become resistant is they either inactivate the, uh, the drug, they, ha they develop a chemical enzyme that, uh, that actually deactivates the drug, that's a smart way to stop the drug working, or they alter the metabolic pathway that's being blocked. So I mentioned about how some metabolic pathways are being blocked by the antibiotic. Well, there's lots of ways you might go from that chemical to that chemical, and they just work out another way to go around there. Um, to, to be able to do that. Okay, so that's another way to get around the, the problem. Uh, alteration of the target site. So if this chemical is blocking something, well, what happens if you change the shape of whatever it is that's blocking? A ribosome, for example, sh changes shape a little bit and no longer will that chemical work there. Or we might have reduced drug accumulation. Uh, and one thing that they can do is actually push out the drug faster than it's going in. And if they can do that, then it's not going to build up and cause um, um, toxicity for, for the bacteria. Um, and so, yeah, all these mechanisms are, are, are being used. We now have a number of bacteria that are now becoming resistant against a wide variety of antibiotics. Now, one of the, the ones that people have heard about the most is Staphylococcus aureus, often known as golden staph. And in fact, in general, if you say golden staph to people, people often go, oh! Golden staff, that's dreadful. Yeah, that's the one that kills the people in the hospitals. The reality is, I think 
if we took a swab, all of you would be covered in golden staff. Now, hopefully, not too many of you, but unfortunately a number of you, will actually have the golden staff that is both potentially pathogenic, but also contains multiple resistance to multiple bacteria, uh, antibiotics. And so not all um, golden staph organisms, which is a very common skin organism, are going to be pathogenic, and not all of them are going to be um, multi-resistant. But unfortunately, more and more of us are carrying around the more dangerous, the more resistant staph aureus. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people think, oh, yeah, that's the one that we worry about. Well, we need to be more worried about a whole lot of bacteria now. Streptococcus, Enterococcus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, Salmonella, E. coli, the list of organisms that are becoming multi um, antibiotic resistant is getting bigger and bigger. It's not just golden staph. So a few years ago, it was sort of, oh, golden staph's the scary one. They're all scary now. Okay, so how do they actually do it? If it's not by mutation, the main ways they get it is there's a gene that actually helps certain bacteria uh, become resistant. So not all bacteria are affected by one antibiotic. And so some are resistant, some aren't. But they can pass that resistance on. And they do that by a number of ways. One is by transduction. And this is where we get a little bacteriophage that grabs a little bit of the, the genome. Now, often the, the resistant genes are, are actually um, contained in plasmid. So these um, um, bacteriophages are often pretty good at sucking up the plasmid, going on to another bacteria, and injecting the plasmid into the other bacteria. So that's one way, uh, transduction. We've also got transformation. And transformation is where we might kill the bacteria. And you, might, you might think, well, if we can kill the bacteria, then that's the end of the problem. But it's not, because then the genetic material is very unlikely to go into a living bacteria, but occasionally it does. So it's not very often, but occasionally it will transfer from outside the bacteria, the, the intact bacteria, inside the, uh, the, the living bacteria. And all we need to ha have happen is for that to happen once, and then that bacteria now has the resistant gene for that. And finally, we've got conjugation, where some of these bacteria of different species join together and they can share uh, shared genetic uh, bits and pieces, such as plasmids, and they can go backwards and forwards between these. So with transduction, transformation and, tra and conjugation, often using the plasmids, we can start off with a bacteria that is, is susceptible to a wide range of bacteria, uh, of, uh, sorry, of antibiotics, and eventually through transformation, conjugation, transduction, it ends up getting the genes that allow it to be resistant against more and more and more antibiotics. And then it's basically genetic selection. And as I said, the thing that really selects these bacteria is exposure. If we're exposed to, especially to low levels of antibiotics, we then select those ones that have the genes, and we select against the ones that don't have the genes, and very quickly we can start to develop it. Now, how quickly is quickly? Okay, if we have a look at, uh, at some of those timescales that I mentioned beforehand, well, and we've got some timescales here, as the incidence of, of infections of multi-resistant organisms of various types, it often seems to be a couple of decades before we go from first seeing a bacteria that, that is is multi-resistant to seeing it commonly, but it, it's, uh, well, if we see those graphs, they, they just keep rising and keep rising. And so as we go on, it's, okay, you can call that slow, I, th I think it's um, s scarily fast, but sh uh, year after year we're getting rising levels of more and more bacteria that are resistant against more and more um, antibiotics. Okay, so why are we in the situation that we're in? Well, basically, the main problem isn't to do with animals. So I'm going to talk about animals and their role in this. But the reality, it's not the main contributor. Now, some people want to jump on that bandwagon and say, oh, it's antibiotics use in animals, and we should ban antibiotics in animals. And that horrifies me, because as a vet who needs to look after the welfare of animals, I'm horrified to think we could be in a situation somewhere in the future where I can't use antibiotics um, to, to treat animals because animals will die, because we could have used those antibiotics, but we can't use those antibiotics, so therefore the animal dies. And so I, I for one, and many, many other vets in my profession, uh, are very concerned about the fact that we are he heading to a situation 
where perhaps we're not going to be able to, to, to use um, antibiotics with animals. And this is because it's a contributor to the problem. But it's not the main contributor. So I don't want to uh, belittle the, the contribution that animals uh, make, but I also want to highlight the fact that they're not the only contributor. In fact, as I said, they're a minor contributor. So what, what's the contributors? One of the major contributors is the fact that it's your problem. Who's gone to the doctor and said, oh, I've got a cold, I've got a thing, and the doctor said they've got a virus? As, have any of you said, oh, I went to the doctor and I was really disappointed because the doctor didn't give me any, any drugs. The doctor give, didn't give me any antibiotics. Anyone been upset about that? Well, perhaps we need to think about that and go, maybe we didn't really need it. The doctor said, this is a viral infection and I didn't really need antibiotics. Now, I can tell you in the past, People used to demand that. They'd go to the doctor and they'd go, and they used to do this to vets too. They'd, they'd go to the doctor and they'd say, oh, I've got a cold. And the doctor would say, oh, yes, it's a virus. It's going around. This is not a bacteria. So viruses aren't affected by um, antibiotics. Um, and so they'd go, oh, well, you know, look, it doesn't look like you've got any bacterial uh, infection here. It's just a viral infection. Um, and they might have even said, oh, I don't know whether you need antibiotics. But the, and then the people would be getting sort of anxious and going, you've got to give me my antibiotics. I need my antibiotics. I need my... And so the doctors would be going, oh, OK, just to be on the safe side, let's give you antibiotics. They knew it probably wasn't necessary, but you know, you, you were so happy when you got the antibiotics script and you went to the, the chemist, oh, I've got my antibiotics, got my antibiotics. We're the part of the problem. We're a major part of the problem. So hopefully, more and more of us are now going, okay, if the, if the doctor says I don't really need antibiotics, I'm going to be happy about that. I'm not going to demand antibiotics. Uh, just because I, I'm scared of what might happen, I'm going to actually um, um, rely on the expertise of the doctor and if the doctor says I don't need the antibiotics, maybe I don't need to do it. Maybe the doctor offers antibiotics and I go, well, look, I'm worried about this resistant problem. And they go, yeah, well, that's right. So, you know, look, um, I could give you the script, but only use it if, you, if you're not feeling better after three days or something like that. Sometimes that's, that's done. And I reckon that's really good. Now, you didn't use the prescription. Fantastic! That's not a bad thing, that's a great thing. So um, we are starting to improve, but it's been a long, long time coming. People going to hospital, it used to be, as soon as you went to hospital, they'd inject you with some antibiotics. But I'm, I'm coming in for, an, for, for a, um, I don't know, some, some minor problem, it might have been a facelift. I'm going, not that I need a facelift, but um, some minor, minor pr procedure. They'd give me a shot of antibiotics before anything happened. Do I have an infection at this point? No. Well, why am I? Prophylactic antibiotics, just in case you get an infection. So just in case, we'll, we'll dose you up with antibiotics. More and more, that's being resisted. OK, so in hospitals, oh, look, there's all that stuff that we used to do 100 years ago. In hospitals, you used to have scary nurses. Oh, we're very nice nurses, but it's also scary nurses who'd go, don't touch that, and you have to scrub your hands before you do this, and this has to be cleaned, and they were really, really strong on hygiene. And they had to be, because that was one of the biggest protections against uh, post-surgical infections, hygiene. And then in the 1970s, we sort of forgot about hygiene. So, you know, we, you know, I was mentioning about how in the textbooks they were starting to say, well, we don't need to, to produce textbooks on bacterial infections. They were also starting to say, oh, hygiene, yeah, look, hygiene's OK, but it's not that important. Antibiotics, yeah, they're really good. Um, hygiene, yeah, look, wash your hands, because it's not nice to, to have grubby hands. But hygiene, yeah, who cares? Well, not quite that, but we didn't... We, didn't, we weren't as scrupulous about hygiene as we were. If we visit the hospitals and we go to those, those wards that are set up for these multi-resistant organisms, guess what? They know all about hygiene and they practice really high, scrupulous levels of hygiene. We need to rediscover hygiene. And so we need to rediscover how to clean things and keep things clean and not contaminate things. And so. There's, well, we're in the process of a, of a revolution in hospitals trying to improve the, uh, the practices there, not relying on antibiotics. It used to be that, well, if there's an infection, no, no, we'll just prevent that in the first place by just giving them antibiotics. Um, chances are, say 20 years ago, if you went to the hospital 
There's no way you'd go in and out, no matter what you went for, without being given antibiotics. Maybe you're just visiting someone. No, I don't think that was likely. But um, if you went in for some procedure, no matter what it was, you probably, I, I'd be surprised if you didn't end up with antibiotics. Nowadays, maybe not. And so, therefore, we need to be much more careful. Maybe you wait and see whether the person gets an infection before you use the antibiotics. Okay, so this is where most of the attention needs to be given, and it is being given. But what about animals? Okay, so there's a number of ways that animals can contribute to the problem. One of them is that we have the animal-based products with residues of the antibiotics. The residues are then taken in with the animal-based products by us, and then we are exposing our pathogens to those low levels of the residues. This certainly could contribute to the problem. Okay? It's not the major contributor, but it's a potential contributor. Why should we take a risk in adding to the risk of, of what is potentially going to be the biggest killer to us in a few years' time um, by not doing that? So therefore, we need to be very, very uh, cautious about um, the residues getting into the food chain and getting to us. Okay, that's where um, uh, withholding periods and all the rest of it come into it. As well as that, we also have um, animals being treated and, okay, they eliminate some of these um, antibiotics, maybe through the urine or whatever. So what happens to the antibiotic then? Well, it can end up in the environment. And if we use lots of antibiotics in animals, we can end up with the environment and maybe even the water waterways uh, getting small doses of the antibiotics. Now, I'm talking about very, very small doses, but remember, it's small doses that cause the problem. We're now finding, or the zoologists are finding, um, evidence that there's actually resistant bacteria out there in, in the environment that are resistant against antibiotics. And sometimes the, the, the very special antibiotics that we think are the most useful still at this point, the ones that, that we've been holding back on and holding back on to, to try and save those people dying of multi-resistant infections. Well, how's that happening? And that's because even small doses of the antibiotics getting out into the environment can do that. Now, it can get out of our bodies into the environment, but it also can get from animals into the environment. So environmental contamination is becoming a bigger and bigger issue now, um, especially in some countries where there's more extensive use of, of um, antibiotics. Uh, but even in, in, um, in uh, more developed countries, we st still need to be very scrupulous about how we're doing, uh, how we're act using um, antibiotics um, and trying to decrease this environmental contamination as, as, as well. And the other thing is that I mentioned before that we have these antibiotics, uh, sorry, these uh, bacteria that can infect animals and then move to humans, zoonoses, and I'll be talking about them next week. Well, what happens if they become resistant because of antibiotic use in the animals? and then they move to humans. Well, they're still going to be resistant against those antibiotics. And so we can have infections that are, are now going to be much harder to treat in animals, in, in, in people, because of the use of the antibiotics in, in animals. So all three major routes into, um, into us can potentially increase the problem. Okay, it might be not the major problem, but it's certainly something we need to do something about, and it's something we can do something about. Now, we can try to be better. We can try to bring in practices that uh, will allow us to, 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 to control that, and I'll get on to that. But what happens if we don't do that? What happens if we don't care about that? Well, I know what the, the issue is there. Um, the health authorities are going to safeguard human health, and they're going to have a simple answer to that withdraw the use of antibiotics in animals. Already there's a lot of medicos that argue that. There's medicos who say, this is ridiculous, we should not use antibiotics in animals. And I sort of quiver a little bit when I hear that, because that would be really scary to not be able to use them in animals. But there's certainly there's a strong lobby that's building that says no antibiotics. Regardless, there's fewer and fewer antibiotics being available for animals anyway. There's a few antibiotics, uh, for example, um, um, chlorophenicol. It used to be a fantastic drug for, for treating eyes of infections in eyes of, of animals. We can't use that now with um, our food producing animals. It's banned. Why is it banned? Because we're safeguarding that chemical for human use. Um, 
um, uh, streptomycin is another one banned from human use. There's more and more antibiotics being withdrawn from human use anyway. It's going to get worse if we don't take this very seriously. So, in the past we've used antibiotics for things like promoting the growth of animals. It turns out small doses of antibiotics can actually make some animals, under certain circumstances, grow faster. That's not such a smart idea, maybe, and there's more and more controls against the use of antibiotics as, as growth promoters. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, inadequate control. Okay, if we do treat for legitimate reasons, we've got to make sure that it doesn't get into the, uh, the food chain. And it has in the past. From Australia, there's sulfonamides that have ended up in veal going to the US, tetracyclines in the milk going to Japan. We haven't been as squeaky clean as we'd like to be. We need to do uh, much better control over that. Okay, usually due to failure of uh, withholding periods, overdosing, and I'm, I'm just reiterating the things that I've mentioned before, inappropriate um, ap um, application. So um, we've got to look at, at um, the way that it's affecting. And also this allergy issue, I think, is a, a, another reason why we need to, to look at it. So we don't want to be exposing our population to residues of, of chemicals that could also have other effects such as things like um, allergies. So the epidemiology is pretty complex. So if that looks complex, it's supposed to be. There's lots of ways that the, um, the animals, antibiotics, humans, human systems, animal systems interact and contribute to the problem. So how do we solve this? Not just by one single measure. We've got to look at many, many measures at different levels by different people in order to be able to cope with this. Now, I'm not going to go through each of these in great detail because I'm running out of time, um, but it's important that everyone has their own focus on how we're going to help this. So for us vets, we need to make sure we um, select the most appropriate antibiotic. Okay, I'll, I could be guilty of this in, in the past as well. Oh, we've got a sick animal. I'll try this one. I'll see how we go. Um, it turns out this antibiotic doesn't work. Oh, I'll just try this antibiotic. Oh, that didn't work either. I'll try this antibiotic. Um, what I should have done earlier on is do a, do a, a swab, um, have a look for, uh, at the antibiotic sensitivity, and then I'd be much quicker at getting on to the, the treatment that's going to be uh, most appropriate. Use narrow spectrum agents. So it, it used to be that, oh, well, what I can do is just give a, a, an antibiotic treatment that contains a couple of different antibiotics, and I don't know which one will work. doesn't matter because I, I just inject it all into the animal, and it works. Well, it works for a short time, but because I'm exposing the animal to lots of different antibiotics, then that's not going to work as well. So I need to, to just target it with the most appropriate antibiotic uh, for the most appropriate time. And more and more, there's last line antibiotics. Now, these are ones that are being um, restricted from, from veterinary use. But I think the veterinary profession also needs to say, well, some drugs we're not going to use except when we really, really need to, to, to use them. Now, for example, in piggeries, uh, lots of pigs get um, infections. And so how do we prevent them or how do we deal with those infections? Unfortunately, there's a lot of therapeutic use of, of antibiotics. And uh, unfortunately, this means that sometimes those antibiotics that we've been using haven't worked as well. And so it's very tempting to just keep on using more and more and newer and newer antibiotics. But maybe we need to try and restrict that and say, even though they, these antibiotics aren't working quite as well, let's not use these particular chemicals because they're really being reserved as the last line. Um, don't use it for non-infectious related purposes. Growth promotion in animals, I think, has always been a very suspect um, practice, but therapeutic use in animals, I think, is something we've got to question as well. Um, treat um, infections only uh, when it improves patient out uh, outcome overall. Um, the reality is animals may recover without needing antibiotics. Well, if they don't need the antibiotics, maybe we don't need to give the antibiotics. Um, short courses. Now, hopefully when you go to the doctors and the doctor says, well, I'll, you, I'll give you the prescription. Now, you need to take these for a certain number of days or for a certain time. It's very important that you do that. Now, what happens if you take a couple of days or what happens if I'm treating an animal and it's a big bull and I, I give it a couple of injections and then on the third day, the bull's feeling so much better or I'm, I'm taking antibiotics and on the third day, I'm feeling so much better. I don't like taking tablets. No, I won't take any more tablets. 
I feel better. It's, it's, done, it's done its job. Don't need to take any more injections. Or in the case of the bull, uh, the bull's getting harder and harder to inject. It doesn't like getting injections. So I stopped doing the antibiotics. Well, what's go that, that going to do? Well, the level of antibiotics is going to start to drop and drop and drop, and we're going to expose the antibiotics to low levels of antibiotics, building up resistance. So if we use antibiotics, we need to use the whole course and make sure that if you, you've given the antibiotics, you are going to actually use the whole, whole course. Um, give it the correct um, um, time, so if we're, we're using it because of um, some sort of inf um, surgical um, reason, it needs to be timed um, to be effective for that. Um, however, there's other things we need to do. Um, infection control and hygiene are perhaps even more important than worrying about which antibiotic to use in a lot of cases. So I'm not saying don't use antibiotics, but I'm, I'm certainly saying perhaps we've over relied on antibiotics and not enough on infection control and good old hygiene. Washing your hands is actually not such a bad idea. Um, but you've got to wash your hands the right way. Anyone know how you work out how long you need to wash your hands after going to the toilet? Who's, whose birthday is it today? Every, every, every person needs to celebrate their birthday twice when they go to the toilet, okay? And the reason being that you go, happy birthday to me, happy birthday to me, happy birthday to me, happy birthday to me. That's one. Happy birthday to me, happy birthday to me. That's how long you need to wash your hands for. Now, there's been surveys that are done where people said, oh, wash your hands, and, and after they come out of the toilet, they say, oh, how long did you wash your hands for? Oh, I did it about 20 seconds. Oh, I did it about 15 seconds. Rubbish! People overestimate how long they wash their hands for. The only way you really know how long you're going to wash your hands for is either time it or sing happy birthday twice. So, <laughs> anyway, I think that's a handy little, uh, little thing. Hygiene, really important. Um, more vac use of vaccines might be a better way. And infrastructure, if we can improve safe water supplies, less infections, housing, better housing, better feed supply. We don't need antibiotics quite so often. As, as well, and there's a website to, to, that, uh, that looks at, uh, at how we do that. What about the producers? Well, as far as the farmers go, they need to be cautious about what they're doing and they need to do things well. Now, often what happens with antibiotics is that the, uh, the vet comes out and leaves the antibiotics. Now, in most cases, antibiotics can only be sourced via the vet. The vet has to prescribe them. The vet has to say, well, you need the antibiotics and this is for how many days. But typically, uh, for economics and for practicalities, the vet doesn't actually inject the animal for every day. So it leaves the bottle of um, antibiotics. And then it's up to the, uh, the farmer or the producer to actually administer it. And that's where they need to do something very, very important. Now, there's a number of things you can do, but th it really s boils down to one thing read the label, because most of the things that I'm going to mention here are basically on the label. So if you read the label and do what the label says, it's probably going to be the main thing. So if it says two doses a day for five days, that's what you do. Um, you don't keep the um, antibiotics afterwards. Um, once it's out of date, there's less uh, antibiotic. Um, it's going to increase the chance of resistance. Um, okay, not moving it from original package, because the original package actually has the instructions. It has all that label information, which is really important. It also says on the label, store correctly, refrigerate it. If, it, if you leave it in the heat or in the sun, um, the antibiotic becomes less effective, building up resistance. Um, you need to identify the animals being treated so you're not using it for the wrong animals and, and therefore giving lower doses to more animals. Um, and you need to use the right dose, dose rates. So if it's based on weight, you need to know the weight of the, the, the animal and you need to be able to measure the right, uh, right dose. Use the whole course and don't just change from one drug to another. Comply with withholding periods. I think I've made that point plenty of times. That's really important. And then also, not just a matter of antibiotics, but also think about controlling new animals coming in, quarantining them, monitoring how things go, looking at environmental control, especially hygiene. Happy birthday to you. Um, and also trying to improve the general health status of the animals. TLC is almost, I won't say as effective as antibiotics, but TLC of our animals can sometimes have dramatic effects on their health. And maybe we don't need to worry about antibiotics quite so often if we look after our animals uh, even, even, uh, even more, uh, better.
And then at the government level, there's more and more that's being done. Now, I've given you a, a reference to what's actually a number of years old, but the, uh, the Jet, uh, uh, Jetacar um, paper has highlighted, a number of years ago, 1999, highlighted that this is a serious issue and there's, that it makes a number of recommendations, as you can see. Um, and these recommendations are still being in, um, enacted. And so even though it might seem a number of years ago, it's still pretty good advice on what we need to do. And so the governments have their, their, their action as well. Departments of agriculture, and etc., et need to be monitoring things, and, which is what they're doing, and they need to be bringing in action um, to, to do things as, as, as well. OK, so it all sounds rather bad, but maybe there's light at the end of the tunnel. And we keep on hearing in the news about new antibiotics. Like just last week, I think it was, um, there was in the news, platypus milk may help us fight antibiotic resistance. But apparently there's an antibiotic-like uh, substance produced by... <coughs> excuse me, platypus milk. So the scientists are very, very diligently trying to extract this drug trying to produce it and trying to see whether it's going to be a replacement antibiotic. Will that be the case? Well, I'd like to think so, but I'm not holding my breath because unfortunately lots of these stories come and go. We're certainly looking for new antibiotics. It just has happened that over the last few years there haven't been any new antibiotics available uh, being pr produced, being discovered. So we're still looking for it and hopefully that'll be the answer. Also phage therapy, this is using uh, the natural parasites of the bacteria to kill the bacteria. Um, interesting research at present, we're still a long way off uh, solving the problem with phage therapy. Uh, ABC transporters, these are the things that actually get the, allow the bacteria to, to push out the, the antibiotic. So if we can target them, maybe that'll help the antibiotics work. And as well as that, lots of testing, looking for any substance that might become the next antibiotic. I don't think we can rely on that. I think we've got to really do what we need to do based on the sort of advice I'm, I'm, I've been giving you, rather than just say, oh, <coughs> these very smart people will come up with new antibiotics. It doesn't look like that's going to necessarily... <coughs> Excuse me. I don't think I've got antibiotic-resistant antibiotic bacteria uh, present. But anyway, here's some resources if you want to look things up. There's a nice Catalyst program, I think very entertaining and, and quite informative, uh, from a year or so ago, but still available. Um, I think that's well worth wa watching. And we've got to watch out for these sneaky bacteria that are becoming resistant. Okay, let's stop there. Okay, I'm going to close down. <laughs> There's a good cut. I'll, yeah, I'll shut down because you. Yeah. Yeah. I do, I do. I don't think it's an infection, I just think I am talking too much. Too no, anyway, no, I enjoy that time. No, I'm sure it's, it's a good, good lecture to do. Yeah. And I love you, and I love you, and I love you, as well. Oh, that's not good. Well, I guess I'll see you next week. Yes, I'll see you next week. At the start. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks.
Tuesday afternoon might be the thing, or uh, so send me an email and then we can work awesome. out a time. Thank you. So this is about the symposium? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, Sadie. Hello, Mark. Stanley, did you get a reply from Gary? I did not. How awful. That is not good, is it? <laughs> 